Edo MBM are basically an offshoot of a massive US arms conglomerate, uh, Edo Corporation. They supply mainly the US and the UK government. They're huge, they get huge contracts with, uh, with the US military. Um, the company in England um, has factories in Brighton and in Fisher's Gate. They manufacture lots of kind of auxiliary parts that are used in, um, in fighter aircraft. They make the components to turn a plane into a fighter plane. For aircraft they specialise in pylon ancillaries which means anything which is held onto the plane um, under the wing. So they make kind of the high tech little tiny bits. The nuts and bolts, release mechanisms. They make the circuit boards and the little bits and bobs that go in there. Without them, without these electrical components, um, the weapons won't work. And according to their website, they supply uh, the uh, Australian Air Force, the um, British the Air Force, the US Air Force, the, and the Israeli Air Force. Edo MBM, because it, that's, uh, even though it's an American-owned company, it's, um, it is British and has to comply with British law. They're a lot more circumspect in their information. They, um, they find it very hard to admit that they sell anything to Israel, for example. We know that they make bomb release mechanisms for F-16s. We know they make a vital component for the Paveway bomb, the most used munition in Iraq. So they're, they're one link in the chain, uh, which is giving states the power to uh, take part in war crimes like those being committed in Iraq and Palestine. Does anyone know what the war is about? Oil! 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 Well, the campaign really grew out of the anti-war movement um, that sort of really kicked off in 2002-2003. It started because there was so much anti-war feeling at, that, at the beginning of the war with Iraq. The marches that people had been on in London didn't really have any effect. You know, what are we going to do? There's no point um, marching in London with two million people. That has absolutely no effect. One year on, um, we decided after the war had, had um, been officially declared over, we decided that we'd have a, you know, try and revitalise the anti-war movement in Brighton. I think people um, perhaps thought that it'd be a good idea to look more closely into the links between um, the local community and and the war in Iraq. There was a meeting at the Friends Meeting House in Brighton where we discussed. Um, amongst other things, direct action. And um, one of the things that was discussed almost by the way was the fact there was this arms factory in Brighton. We found out that the, uh, there was a company called Edo Corporation operating in Moulscombe um, from a press release on the internet. We had this factory in our backyard that was producing the munitions, the very sort of weapons that were being used in Iraq and this might be a far more effective target for protest. So we marches in the streets of London or the streets of Brighton. The company was, was proud to be supporting the, uh, the US-UK uh, war effort in Iraq. This is where the, um, the germ of the, the Smash Edo campaign came from. I kind of then realised, I think a lot of people did, that you know, there's, there's, a real, there's a real campaign to be, to be had here. We decided to start a campaign um, aimed at closing the factory down. Everybody you know, thought it was a good idea and got on board, basically. You know, Edo MBM, out on, where it is on Home Farm Road, we're talking about a mile and a half city centre, you know, I wouldn't have a bus ride to, to go to where Edo MBM are. The first act of um, direct action, I suppose, at the factory was uh, blockade and rooftop occupation of the factory. Thursday, the 20th of May, 2004. This is a demonstration at Moorscombe in Brighton. Camera operator is PC Palmer, Charlie Papa 083. Comms officer is... PC Pete Searle, Charlie Sierra 225. And uh, driver is... For the day, PC Graham Masters AM 271. And thank God it's only for the day. The main aim of it was a big publicity stunt. It was simply to get people knowing that there, were, that there was an arms company in Brighton. For those that haven't been up the front there, there are two aspects to this. That's 0730 a protest activist in place against Francis called EDO-NBM. 
The significant thing for those premises is that they make bits that go on the wings of tornado aircraft that drop bombs in Iraq. So there were sex of us d lot by a neck to a, to a set of Harris fencing, like the cages you get around building sites. That was set up in the middle of Home Farm Road, effectively blocking access to and out of the factory. And we were locked on the inside by Bionex, by D-Lux. Police were very, very cautious at first because not having had to deal with an action like that uh, in Brighton probably for a long time, they didn't quite know what to do. I've explained to them that Sussex and Brighton police understand that theatrical forms of protest are an interesting way and an effective way of protesting. I'm not against that. Um, in fact, it was a dual action. There was uh, not only a blockade, but somebody went on to the, several people went onto the roof. Two aspects to this, there are six people found on the roof of EDO, no damage has been caused and they haven't intruded on the premises. It's essential that they do not intrude on the premises, so we need to be alert that anything we do down this end of the road, if it provokes a reaction at the top of the road, the sanctity of that building will be paramount. We managed to keep the road shut for, um, for you know, uh, probably about six hours, I'd say, it's actually. My proposal is that we'll make use of the tactical equipment that we've got to cut through the one shackle that holds the barrier together on the far right hand corner. I think they took advice from other police forces, you know, um, who have experience in this kind of in these kind of protests. Speaking with John Reed, tactical advisor, we'll take that advice and have contact with Thames Valley Police this morning, Cambridge Police and the Metropolitan Police who've got some experience of doing this type of thing. We know that this is a highly motivated group of protesters. Nothing wrong with that, nothing wrong at all. We do didn't know what to do and they um, they told all, all, all their workers not to come in that day. What I'll say to you is I want to keep the plan such as I've described as simple as possible. What I'll say to you is a plan, however imperfect, is better than no plan. Yeah, I think that the Edo probably realised that, that they were known about and their, their cover was blown as it were. The first direct action really gave them a flavour of what the campaign was going to be like, that we weren't just going to be about symbolic bearing witness, you know, quiet demos and, and banner holding, that it was going to be a campaign that had a, a full toolbox of tactics, one of which was going to be direct action. I think it was kind of very much the, the kind of announcement that, you know, to the world that the campaign was kind of, uh, sort of fully formed. I would like EDO to leave Brighton. Um, I would like the arms trade to end, but I feel there should be a movement in Brighton against this particular company. We want to get them out. All the noise demos started up after that. People came, started to come up there um, on a weekly basis. At that stage, it was quite a small campaign. There, there were probably between seven and ten people. And this would consist of people going up uh, with drums, pots and pans, uh, megaphones and, and loudspeakers, uh, trying to make as much noise as possible to basically to, to make it impossible for the workers to, to leave work um, without having to think about what they did for a living. The campaign was getting uh, quite intense. Um, there were regular demonstrations up there. There were it wasn't just the weekly demos, there were also surprise demos up there. There had been demonstrations outside the homes of the directors. At first, at the very early stages, we found that we were confronting the arms industry. But then we had the addition where the, the uh, police started to encroach on our rights and become ever increasingly in the way of our protests. You can walk away, this is a free highway. They can, they can walk away, we are non-violent, we are peaceful, they can walk away when they yeah, want. They're doing their job, they're trying to feed their families, aren't they? They're trying, to, they're trying to pay their bills, which you obviously must relate to. We of course um, caught the police's attention, and at that stage they would attend the demonstrations, but on a very small scale. And in fact, you know, the, the police presence up there just got heavier and heavier. The 21st of March 2005 was the turning point of the campaign. I think with the weapons inspection, by the start of that action, you know, it was obviously something something that happened. And you know, I think in the, in the background, the police had been, had been conspiring with the EDO, the, the factory. It's not uncommon for the police to work quite closely with um, an organisation. 
and uh, particularly where the, the people within that organisation claim to be victims of crime. Right from the very beginning, um, we were extensively filmed, right from the very bottom of the road, which from my point of view that was a real turning point because I had not seen the police filming us um, on previous demonstrations. When we got to the top of the road, um, there was a large police presence there and amongst the police officers there were some more high-ranking officers which again was something we hadn't seen before. The police were most insistent that um, we remained on the other side of the road and issued us with, for the very first time with a Section 14 notice. This is Sussex Police notice that under section 14 of the Public Order Act 1986, I have taken notice that the Public Assembly is being held. It seems there was certainly a change of tactics when they started to rely on section 14 to try and restrict protest activity outside Edo. And there were a number of occasions around that time then when people received these notices and on one occasion there was only two people there and they received a notice under section 14 of the Public Order Act in an attempt to restrict where they should protest. Why are you standing there with your camera filming a private meeting which is obviously private? No thank you, no thank you. Why are you provoking this meeting officer? The assembly will be confined to the opposite side of the road. In hindsight that was quite significant because the terms of the Section 14 order were very similar to um, the injunction that they were asking for um, and we received that just a few days after the Section 14 order. You have been warned if you fail to comply, you're liable to arrest. On that bank there. That's not really that's not really that's not really and that's when people started to be threatened with arrest and people were actually arrested. It gets to a point when you have to draw a line and the line has to be drawn between what we call civil disobedience, which is probably okay, and intimidation harassment, which isn't. The moment the three arrests were made on the day of the weapons inspection, there was telephone communication between Chief Inspector Kerry Cox and Timothy Lawson Cruttenden. It was the following day after that that Mr Lawson Cruttenden issued the proceedings in the High Court. No one was prepared for what in fact happened. Legitimate protest or outright harassment, a British arms manufacturer is accusing anti-war activists of intimidating its employees with similar tactics used by animal rights extremists against scientists. The tactics are the same. Yeah. I mean, and a lot of these groups are very um, modelled on the RA. I think it was a definite strategy of, of uh, EDO and their lawyers. To, to say this case is just like the animal rights protest. The OMBM, which makes weapons parts, is seeking a High Court injunction tomorrow to stop the protesters getting near its plant. The thing was that most of us involved in the campaign had never even heard of these things until it happened. Legal papers shown for the first time to Channel 4 News allege a deliberate hate campaign against staff, but that is strongly denied by the protesters. For 14 months now we've had demonstrations outside our premises, uh, many of which have gone beyond what I consider to be reasonable. Everybody had ever been arrested at Edo, at any of the blockades, uh, whether they've been found guilty or not guilty, they all received in the post three huge lever arch files of evidence. The directors at EDO will turn to the High Court tomorrow, citing the Protection Against Harassment Act, a law commonly used against stalkers. They're seeking an exclusion zone around the factory in Brighton and around the homes of their employees. Now, when does lawful protest become intimidation? Timothy Lawson Cruttenden was involved in, in drafting uh, in given advice and drafting the, the Protection from Harassment Act. I suppose under this Act and the way we've developed the, the law on this Act is to, is to take civil disobedience, which is okay, and ask the court to make it content. What um, Timothy Lawson Cruttenden, obviously, had 
thought this out all along was able to do was to basically define corporations as people um, and uh, <laughs> bring about the idea that protesters are effectively stalking a corporation. We've suffered from um, regularly noise protests once a month, uh, once a week rather. That involves drumming a, uh, banging a drum, um, banging pots and pans, shouting at our staff when they leave for, at the end of their day. What I think is significant about the housing tax is that the injunctions under the Act um, have a criminal power of arrest. That's the first thing, which is quite novel. The aim of these injunctions is to create these areas where if you don't obey that, then the police can just arrest you. The injunction that was sought by EDO went way beyond uh, uh, drawing the, the balance between lawful and unlawful conduct. EDO were, were asking for um, an exclusion zone of half a mile uh, around the factory um, which pe protesters couldn't, couldn't enter. And remember, you know, a protester could be anybody, uh, anybody that Edo deemed to be a protester. So, for example, it had the consequence that one of the people who'd been involved in the protests over a long period of time uh, wouldn't have been able to actually go to his own home. It's as crazy as that. The, the injunction would only have allowed ten or less people every Thursday afternoon for two, hour, for two hours to demonstrate silently outside the factory. Their intention was that it would apply to absolutely everybody. An injunction against the world. The entire basis that the injunction was being brought against us was, was wrong because it took away our right to protest. I mean, is it not a dangerous area, though, of, of restricting protest? No, I don't think so. I think we fully accept everybody's right to protest. Fortunately, we live in a democracy, and that's one of people's rights. EDO MBM, a company in Brighton that makes parts for the defence industry, has been granted an exclusion zone around its premises. The High Court has told protesters that they Judge can't Gross, um, who, was, who was presiding over this hearing, said uh, freedom of expression is a, is a right jealously guarded in English law. And he, uh, he didn't allow most of the terms of the injunction. What was originally a law, that was designed to protect people from stalkers um, became a, basically a charter for corporations to get a sort of form of PFI martial law outside their premises and it meant that demonstrations became confined to this narrow strip of grass that bordered a, a big drop onto a railway line. Right they're going to try and impose this interim injunction and it's nonsense and it restricts our freedom to protest and we're not going to have any of it. In the lead up to uh, when the interim injunction came into, came into force, protests had grown uh, against Lido MBM. People had heard about the interim injunction and people um, were very angry about it. We held a demonstration and it was billed as the big one and it certainly was a big one. The intention was to really give the injunction a good hygiene by the protesters. We knew that the, the order for the interim injunction had, had finally been signed and that it was going to come into place, but we really, we weren't sure about what the effects of, of that order was going to be. So we started at the bottom of the, um, of the hill that led up to the factory. So we set off on the grass verge a bit further back. At that point, um, this man appears with another man filming him he looked a bit funny he had this little moustache and a bald head and a monkey suit he's obviously not a policeman order number one sir what's this who are you sir order number two sir nobody knew what was going on he didn't discuss his role with indie media news right who are you sir he then started going round. order number one sir order number two sir order number four sir tell us who you are Obviously. people didn't know who this man was um, uh, most people thought he was a policeman or he was an officer with the court and bailiff, something like that. They had no idea who he was or what he was trying to do. Um, and they had no idea what was going to happen. From the outset, some people said, no, I'm not taking that, I'm not having anything to do with it. These were the injunctions. Serving injunction consists of touching someone with a piece of paper. It doesn't matter if they understand it or read it or know what it is. Just, just that they've been touched by the piece of paper. Slap. Served. The idea of that was that once it's served on people, they then, in theory, know what the injunction is, and so breaking it then becomes a crime. The way he did it was aggressive, but it was funny, because a lot of people were just running away from him, and he was too slow to catch up with them. <laughs> It all looked very 
Mm. As far as we were concerned, this great big bald thug was just wandering around assaulting people. If that touches you, it's been served. Yeah. It's your property. Well, I'm standing here. If I had seen an assault, I would have dealt with it. I didn't see an assault. People asked the police uh, who this man was who was who was trying to serve these bits of paper on them um, and weren't given that information. Serving it on you, so you walk wrong. If anyone... We later found out that this was Mark Lynch, uh, one of the top dogs for Guardian Guard security. But this, this was kind of what would become one of the regular themes of these demonstrations. Being punched in the chest in the guise of these um, That's kind of set the tone for Mark Lynch, the wonderful Mark Lynch. So he then continued in that vein for many months. This probably should have been a taste of things to come. The march uh, moved off and people walked up Pine Farm Road and marched up to the factory uh, like they had done many times before. really quite passionate because this was, you know, this was, as it was the first time the injunction had been put in force, this was a kind of test of, you know, the, the, you know, the, the will of the protesters versus the um, strength of the police. And there was in fact, you know, quite a massive police presence up there. Police vans kept arriving, just more and more police vans. The policing tactics radically changed on that day. It's Operation Spock, it's Tuesday 31st of May 2005, time on watch is 13, 15 hours. Video operator is PC Stradic, CS791, comms operator is... PC Davis, Delta Delta 052. Very soon it was apparent that um, the policing of the demonstration was going to be very aggressive. This camera on. Yeah. Go the black wig, uh, spoke to two officers now, I believe with a foreign accent, I'm not sure the accent is. People could hear the police uh, talking about people here they were singling out. Lady in sunglasses on the right with the two stripes. She's often on opera demos. Don't recognise the other female. He's number one or two or three or four. does appear that they also had a strategy of targeting particular individuals. He's thrown on the floor. To serve him. Can I just say this to those of you that are prepared to listen to me? That there is an injunction in force. The injunction says you must be on that side of the road. If you refuse to clear the road, then you are liable to be arrested for obstruction of the highway. So I'd ask you please to stay off the road until the grass burns. We were told that we had to stay on the road. We were um, instructed to stand on the grass verge, which actually wasn't very easy at times because the verge was very nice. But there were so many people that naturally we just spilled onto the road. It was really, really quite difficult to stay on the verge. So there was loads of people there and they were trying to squish them all onto the grass verge, which just wasn't going to happen. But it was not a safe situation. The orders given by the police crew were not audible anyway. <laughs> And then obviously whoever was in charge decided that the police authority was not stamped heavily enough on this demonstration that we should really, they should really show us who was boss. They formed a kind of military cordon, police closed in. And the police were just marching up and down to make sure that no one had their foot on the pavement. For a while there was a bit of back and forth and the police were being aggressive and surly. They looked really they began trying to physically push people back onto the grass verge. We couldn't push back, uh, we refused to be moved. It was, it was really quite dangerous. They were pushing people towards the little barrier 
that prevents you from falling into the railway line. And any type of freedom of movement on that road is completely taken away from you. Everyone stay on the ground. The last flash is because the obstruction of the highway is still the arrest. Then they just surged forward. Snatch squad. Cat um, got pulled out of the group by the police and thrown to the floor in front of the demonstration. They just like piled him to the ground um, and um, then dragged him away. <laughs> I was arrested, there was uh, another individual shortly after. I was arrested because I went to the aid of my, my father. <laughs> My father was 80 at the time. From that point, there was just a huge scrum. In, in, in the chaos that ensued, um, people were falling over, um, people were falling into a, basically into a pile on the grass verge and trying not to, um, to fall into the railway tracks. There was pushing the police forward and there was pushing backwards and um, I remember someone fell over the barrier. How nobody fell over the edge, I don't know. I was seeming very lucky that day. And it was really, really scary. Some people became frightened and, and there was some, um, some pushing from the crowd. Then when the crowd started, started getting this angry, then it was just open season for them. Any excuse for them to arrest anybody. It was a mess. It was a complete mess. People were, were arrested for assault police, basically for, for ref, refusing to be pushed onto a railway train. Did you get assaulted? I was actually uh, charged with assault the police officer and obstructing another. I was arrested for assault police, uh, basically for being in that chaotic situation. This is the same man that assaulted Peter Jackson earlier. When he was assaulting an 80 year old man. You're arrested for assault on yeah. police, you understand that? You're yes, the same, keep in mind how many things you're not mentioning with questions, something you like to write court. If you suddenly give me an evidence, do you understand that? Okay, thank you. They formed this rank of people, this of police, shoulder to shoulder. <laughs> People were angry, people were really angry. And you came up, officers of the law, and decided that you were a school protester who was demonstrating peacefully, peacefully, you tried to push us over a cliff, and you got out of your office and said to me, oh, that's quite a big job. You didn't get a warning before you came here to say that if you push people over this fence, they might die. You just thought you'd push anyway on for that. Possess the police to, to basically charge 
I mean, a crowd of people on the edge of their 50s, so I can't, I, I will never know. Several people are now pursuing complaints and civil actions against the police. And what are you doing here anyway? You're coming up as a wizard of the law to support the biggest criminals in this country. The only trial under international law for complicity with war crimes. Yeah! There's certainly a case for the police to answer, to explain how they're how and why uh, their tactics changed on that occasion and how they came to target the particular people they did for arrest. The people who were arrested on that day um, finally it ended up being eight people were, were all, almost all, people who were involved in some way in the High Court injunction proceedings. It's quite clear that the people they were arresting were also people that had already been named on the injunction. Those people were arrested to order. And they arrested people for some quite serious charges. Definitely uh, convictions for any kind of violence um, or assault, which is what most people were arrested for, assault police, um, would definitely have strengthened the idea that we were a violent campaign who would stop at nothing to hurt the workers. I think that that you know, having those those convictions would have been very useful to them. But every time they arrested someone, they would pass the information to the lawyers of Edo in the injunction case. I think that the effect of, of uh, those arrests uh, provided EDO with a case that they didn't have previously of actual harassment. At the end of the day, when the interim injunction was imposed, the judge allowed protest to continue in a sense unrestricted, but it was confined to the grass verge opposite Edo and BM. If you literally stepped off this grass verge, which was only two metres in width, onto the road, even one foot, uh, you would be liable to be arrested and you would be liable to be remanded immediately. Would you mind staying up on the uh, verge, sir? You've uh, read the order. To walk along this road. Right, you've actually read the order time and time again, you're in breach of the order. Right. Are you aware of that? No, no you're not, that's correct. Okay, you would be in breach of the order. I do actually think that probably the judge, when he, he put that clause in, didn't realise how small the grass verge was. I, I think benefit of the doubt that he wouldn't have said that had he realised how dangerous it was. And he really didn't understand the location or anything like that. So the judge had, the, the judge didn't know what he was doing when he gave these these terms. How come he can kill me but I can't kill you? Because I've just served you with your assessor. However he did accept that we shouldn't film. Which actually put us in a very vulnerable position because it then meant that we couldn't actually film any actions by the police or more significantly any actions by security guards. It meant that this goon could run around and basically assault them uh, with us not being able to produce any evidence that he'd done so. I think Mark Lynch um, was employed by Guide Security and Guide Security were contracted by Edo uh, to provide security for them and um, during the injunction they were supposed to be uh, implementing the, the terms of the injunction which meant that they, ha they had to go around handing out, or Mark Lynch had to hand out um, these bits of paper. Whilst the injunction was in force he was kind of take, obviously taking a great uh, delight in, in this kind of um, this increase in his powers. Really enjoyed the authority of it, really enjoyed being able to serve this very official looking injunction on people. But he went far beyond that. His job was not just merely to make he, his job was not merely to make people aware of the injunction, which obviously everybody was aware of anyway, but was to um, actively intimidate. His general kind of attitude is kind of is making it quite personal. He wants to get people. Yeah, he was pretty keen to make sure people got these bits of paper. He had to have um, a sort of mate to film him doing this to get evidence of people being served with the injunctions. Well, it's recording now, Mark. Turn the video recording. It's recording. See that pattern up there? Yeah. Right. One's in. One's in, one's out. And one's out. All right. Present to serve the uh, orders today is myself, Mark Lynch, and John Bradley and Tony Reader. So, right now, it should say stand by, yeah? No, now you record. I hope you've recorded it. Yeah, we have recorded it. Right, come with me, John. Do you want to start filming then, Mike? Yeah. I don't want you or your stupid bits of paper and 
I do not wish this strange man to touch me. 125 served. The employees of the company were, were designated protected people, so they, they were not supposed to be filmed. And a protect, the protected person within the definition of the injunction what, what included a security guard. Who kind of took full advantage of the situation of not being able to be filmed. Now this placed the protesters outside Edo in a, an extremely difficult situation. Well, how can we record your instructions for evidential purposes when if he records you, it's a breach of the injunction? The minute we pointed them in the direction of the building or any of the employees, we, we ran the, the risk of being arrested for breach of the injunction. 432, if you'd like to read that. What is it? You will be arrested if you film, carry on filming. So people we did used to go and try to respect as much as possible the terms of the interim injunction while still filming and that meant a lot of um, people taking cameras and, and turning them only on the, you know, away from the factory and towards the demonstrators. But that was always a difficult, a difficult round and people used to have to argue the toss over that. He hasn't been videoing. He's been videoing, not him. He's been videoing. Right, has he had the video camera out? He has had the video no, camera out. Handle. If it's not been on. And people used to take fake cameras up there, you know, made out of cardboard boxes and people would just come and really push that. And it was something that we argued a lot in court and tried to make the judge aware of, of the danger that we were in because of this rule. And the first, if the first time a security guard was, was being very obnoxious somebody took out a video camera to, to, to record it because as should have happened um, and he found himself arrested by the police and spent a week in, in remand in, in Lewis prison. Paul Robinson was acting as a legal observer on that day filming the actions um, of, of the security staff. The security guard involved went over and seized his camera. He called the police, he got them up there and then got the police to arrest me, which they did, carrying out his orders. The breach being that he was filming a protected person outside Edo. While we were in the police station, Chief Inspector Kerry Cox intervened. There was a telephone call from her, and she said, in effect, that it was right that he should be um, restra detained for breach of the High Court injunction and ultimately that's what he was charged with. He spent several days in custody at Lewis Prison before a Crown Court judge finally granted him bail. I, did, I didn't have a chance to see my solicitor when I was in there at all. Now, he should never have been in custody. He wasn't even named in the injunction. It's an absolute disgrace that Edo can hire people and put them under the terms of the injunction and get them to be protected persons that these people are protected persons and what they're doing is harassment themselves. The campaign became, uh, got a lot more momentum and also became very creative. Obviously, no matter how angry you get, your pencils off as a works of art and not them throwing at people video cameraing you whilst you have no right to do the same to them. There was a life drawing exhibition, I guess taking inspiration from uh, the sort of courtroom pictures where um, where uh, you know you're not allowed to film in court or take photos in court so there are artists that draw pictures of the scene and essentially that's what people did people just brought uh, pens and pads and just drew the factory and drew the employees and the cars and the security guard and everything because you can't stop someone from drawing but we always try to use a little bit of humor more to keep ourselves going but also to try and make the point in lots of different levels there was a, a day of action called carry on up the injunction um, where protesters dressed as Mark Lynch. It was it was basically worth it for the moment where Mark Lynch had to serve injunction papers on several Mark Lynches. It was it was a particularly good good moment. It was just, it was clowning, it was, you know, it was a vicious parody of him. The whole farce of being confined, and it was a farce being confined to Grass Verge, uh, people regularly went up there and 
Yeah. Eventually, the um, the attitude of the security became, you know, it became the level of intimidation was ramped up. Video the kids. I'm not going to serve the children because of obviously their age, but if you can uh, just yeah. video the uh, kids. And he even handcuffed one demonstrator, which is completely illegal. Jaya, who was assaulted by security guards, who then trumped up a charge against him, which the police immediately bought, and they recommended that he should be remanded in custody. When I went to leave the protest, um, I came across a pile of the court injunctions, which are basically A4 pieces of paper. And I looked at them and picked them up, and then I, well, I ripped them up. There's no crime in ripping them up, so I ripped them. And then the security suddenly uh, approached me and said, if you rip that anymore, we're going to arrest you. And I thought, well, I'm not actually committing any offence by ripping them, so I ripped them in half. And the next thing I know, I was um, covered in twisting my arms behind my back and trying to put handcuffs on me. You get a camera out, you're going to get jumped by him and his goons. Jumped. You hear that? Arrest me. Unlawful arrest. You haven't got the right to arrest people in that fashion. You have to stand up in court and justify the assault on a member of the public who did nothing. How are you going to do that? Mark Lynch is one, you know, he's obviously one of these people who failed the entrance exam for the police and became a security guard. If you go around the other side, Tone, and just yeah. fucking open the driver's side and get that key out, it's in there. No, driver's side, yeah. Oh, Pillar. <laughs> right, just in that hole, that first hole there. There you go. Lovely. Got blood on these ones, mate. Eh? Got blood on these. <laughs> What's with these, then? Is that hey? the locks? Yeah, that's the lock ones, yeah. So, uh... Yeah, well, and what I do, across. That's better, actually. they are, that's actually yeah, they are a lot better, that sort of yeah, that's there, right, yeah, they are, they're a hell of a lot better, yeah. Yeah, that is better. Yeah. I've also, this pepper spray stuff, you can't use, because obviously it's classed as firearms, but they've got one out that they tried at the Nick, which is called Bounce. Alright. It comes in a, a black holder. And it's got the old, um, it's got the coil on it, and it clips on there, and it's the proper stuff, and it's bounce. It, it, and right. basically, it's the same stuff, um, but it's not classified as a firearms and that. Oh, Do you yeah. want one? You can have one for nothing, because yeah, I've got some. I'll whip some from yeah, the, from the nick to give it a try. Right, when are you, are you in tomorrow? Well, we were being bullied by the police and the security outside Eda, who were trying to provoke us into. Uh, trying, uh, they were trying to provoke us into violence, they were trying to provoke us into arrestable offences. They weren't letting us film what they were doing. So, what happened was we, we took the campaign into town, we brought the campaign into central town. Churchill Square, the centre of my clock tower, was like the other arm, it was the other support. It, um, we had to get it focused, not just around the factory, but it had to be focused in the centre of Brighton. It was necessary to build a kind of critical mass of sort of local concern about what was happening. The intention of the march was um, to be, to peacefully march through Brighton and to raise awareness. And the August demo that we had um, was just ridiculous. I think there was about 40 people, maybe less, um, that tried to, you know, walk with a banner down the street and they were surrounded by police helicopters, you know, tens of policemen, um, and the road was blocked with police dogs. It, it was ridiculous. We hardly got, like, 50 metres down North Street before they cordoned it all off.
and it was here that Sussex Police basically put on a bit of street theatre. Good afternoon, I'm the police commander for this event. I'm going to impose a direction on you. If you be quiet, you might hear me. Who cordoned off the demonstration in North Street um, and issued a um, order under Section 12 of the Public Order Act um, saying that, that the demonstration couldn't continue. Is there an organiser for this event that can come forward? There was a lot of pushing and shoving and a lot of like sly digs from the police, you know, sly punches and pushes. There were children in push chairs crying and it was real it was one of those really nasty ones again. I got you know, I got quite angry and started arguing with a lot of the police officers. And then they pulled out people to arrest again, the kind of snatch squad style. I just got grabbed from behind, no warning at all. Just got dragged off to a police van. I've got bruises all, all up my arms from where they just basically dragged me by like my by like my arms to the van. Let go! I was 17 at the time. Once again, John, poor, poor old John Cat was arrested again. I couldn't even hear what I was arrested for at the time. And uh, they made, made a whole ugly scene. Themselves. And they arrested Chris again for the use of a megaphone. Chris, again, I honestly feel if ever the police are after me, if I get out a six foot life size photograph of Chris and throw it away, it'll jump on it and I can run away. They were caught on camera really violently assaulting um, other people as well. I think they wanted to kind of make us seem like, you know, they wanted to like criminalise the campaign, and, but instead they actually ended up just showing their true colours, you know, they just showed the public a bit on a busy Saturday near Churchill Square what thugs they actually are. This signalled the start, really, of, of, a, of a, a, a confrontation um, which would go on in Brighton for a couple of years about whether or not uh, people had to notify and negotiate with the police um, before they could gather in their city centre. But certainly at that stage they did seem to feel they had the right to ban protests in Brighton. At the next demonstration which was organised against the factory in town um, the police uh, wrote to um, people who they perceived to be uh, organisers of the march saying that if no notification was given to Sussex Police, um, then um, uh, pro or or organisers of, of the demonstration could be uh, prosecuted. And there was an ongoing struggle here. The police were trying to enforce a situation where all demonstrations had to be given permission by the police to go ahead. And they were they were very big on getting us to negotiate with them, ask permission to demonstrate in our own town. Factors under the law, we don't have to ask permission. Our whole point is freedom of expression and freedom of assembly, and we don't think it is freedom of assembly if you have to ask permission from the authorities first. We think that the right to, you know, as the community, you have the right to march through your own community and to make political points in your own town. The previous demonstration had been, had been re repressed and stamped on by Sussex Police, uh, and that because of that, we needed to have a huge presence um, at the next demonstration 
uh, in order to take back our right to protest. The next time we marched in town, we had nearly 400 people. Last time we were here, we tried to peacefully march down that road over there. And these gangsters in yellow jackets stopped us from peacefully marching. Despite having not asked permission for police, having very widely advertised in the local media that we hadn't asked permission for police, we were able to force the march through. So we started marching down and uh, they completely surrounded us in this kind of mobile kettle. All of the people on the street were really taking notice. They just stopped, got their cameras out, loads of people got their cameras out and were taking photos of us and people were saying what's going on, they wanted to know what had happened and were really interested. So um, they never did that sort of demonstration again because they must have realised they just drew loads of attention to us. Because people had come out in defiance of the police's attempt to control uh, people's access to, to gather in their city, um, they weren't able to, um, uh, to repress uh, the march in, in the way that they'd done before. And I think that was a very important stroke, for, a very, very important blow struck there for civil liberties in Brighton. So a year uh, in court kind of ensued. Our defence was number one that uh, the use of the Protection from Harassment Act in the way that it was being used was a misuse of the law. Around December time um, we'd um, put in several applications about um, the conduct of their lawyers. What Mr Lawson Cruttenden did uh, was try to um, obtain large amounts of disclosure from the police about defendants and witnesses in the court case. It's a very sad reflection of our society that protest groups not only target you know, the opposition, they start targeting the opposition's lawyers. And this is around the time that I think they, 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 they started to rethink uh, what they'd done There, there was this huge legal team um, costing thousands of pounds, um, consisting of Lawson Cruttenden, of, of, of Queen's Council, and of, dip, of another firm of solicitors called LeBerf and Lamb. Um, and there was me and Lorna um, on the other side. The judge uh, ruled that Lawson Cruttenden had abused the process of the court um, and that there had been serious misconduct in the in, in the court case. Well, I mean, I can't I can't really comment on that, mate, because it's yeah. it's the subject of a right, right. complaint. So I mean, I can't say either way. Well, basically, we we we, we won. That the injunction case was uh, was overturned. The interim injunction lasted until March 2006, from uh, I guess May 2005. So almost a year. Court order. That is the injunction now only applies to five named defendants. Thank you very much. Served. Lovely. Any comment? Any comment? Not at all. The injunction, which you've been policing for the last 11 months, now only applies to five named defendants. Right, I'm totally aware of that. Okay. I'm totally... Served. Excuse me. Alright, come here. I am aware of the injunction. I don't need to be told by you. Now go away, demonstrate peacefully, everybody's happy. The police have refused to investigate themselves as to whether they colluded with the company. Big surprise. I w do not have to explain to you. I will not have you can't explain. I will you. not have pieces of paper shoved through my van. Shove Go away. 
You can't really form a partnership with the police because that would be unconstitutional because they're technically they're meant to be what are called the referees in society. They don't have obligations to assist private litigants in obtaining injunctions. That's not their purpose, that's not their role. And where it comes to um, confidential material gathered in the context of criminal prosecutions, they can only disclose that, in my view, with an order of the court. More and more evidence came out that there was close communication between the police and Edo's lawyers. Um, well, that's what the protesters say, and they'll always say that, won't they? So what do you think of the Edo campaign? I mean, I mean, it's, it's obviously um, gathered, gathered. Um, it's... What do you mean? You don't have to comment on whether I agree with it or disagree with it. Well, it's that would, you. No, that would be fair, because we're not there to, uh, to um, take sides. The police admitted that they didn't want to police the protests anymore. A statement was made saying that there were financial implications in policing the ongoing protests, which is one of the reasons why the police sought to support the injunction. But Edo needed arrests. They needed, they needed a stronger injunction. Around the time of the crumbling of, of the injunction, the, the cases which had been brought against campaigners during the time the injunction was in place uh, began to crumble as well. At that time, the, there were cases ongoing against 13 defendants, and um, as a result of, of representations we made to the Crown Prosecution Service, um, all cases were discontinued against all defendants on all charges. And this all started because in January 2006, three protesters had, the, had their case in court. The, the starting point was the weapons inspection case. And in that case, that case was listed for a three-day trial. And we'd managed to get disclosure via the High Court of the line of, of correspondence and communications between Timothy Lawson Cruttenden and a senior police officer. Now we had Mr Lawson Cruttenden's version and we were seeking the police equivalent of those documents. If you like, if we've got record of one phone call, then where's the other side of it? The prosecution um, said that this uh, evidence attracted public interest immunity um, and shouldn't be disclosed. It's a sort of law that's applied to informants um, in, in, in perhaps in drugs cases where the Crown will seek to withhold information because they want to protect the identity of the informant. There, there then ensued a uh, public interest immunity hearing which is closed. And what happened in this case is the judge took the view that there was material that the Crown claimed attracted public interest immunity but that the defence should have. As a consequence of that, the Crown offered no evidence against the defendants rather than disclose that material. So they didn't want to disclose it, so they dropped the case. This evidence, this phantom evidence, became a kind of magic tool. As a follow-on from that, knowing that there was material that the Crown didn't want to disclose, we made an application for all of the other cases the cases just sort of, there was like a domino effect, one after the other after the other, they all just sort of fell down. The case against uh, against Jaya for ABH uh, and, um, and breach of a civil injunction was dropped, and the case uh, against Paul for breach of a civil injunction was also dropped. There was then the eight arrests on the 31st of May, all cases were discontinued by the Crown prior to trial. I received a letter saying that uh, police didn't consider that um, my continuing prosecution was in the public interest, uh, which, which strikes me as, um, as quite surprising if, if, if they really thought that I had assaulted a police officer. It's very unusual. I mean, it's certainly the, one of the cases, um, one of the last cases to be discontinued in the Crown Court, a schedule of cases was handed up and the, the Crown Court judge commented that he had never come across anything like that to have so many cases discontinued. We will never know what that information is that the Crown w sought to withhold, but clearly it was important enough that they hold on to it, that they drop the cases. This whole legal um, attack on the campaign uh, just, just crumbled.
and Edo and and the police were left with uh, with nothing really from from a whole year of uh, attempting to repress uh, protests outside the factory. Ali Shakir Abd Al Hassan, four years old, killed by a missile on the 22nd of March 2003. Ali Jassim, ten years old, killed by a missile on the 25th of March 2003. Abdullah Yassim, 52, killed by a missile, 27th of March 2003. Ali Kamil Almasawi, 13, killed by a missile, 28th of March 2003. Ahmed Khalaf Padawi, 27, killed by cluster bomb, 7th of April 2003. Ali Hussein Musa, 73, killed by missile, 21st of March 2003. Samar Hussein, he was 13 and he was killed by the missile in March 2003. When the missile struck the parents' farm in an area roughly 30 miles from Baghdad. She was in the kitchen when the missile landed and the explosion was close enough for shrapnel to cut through the house's stone walls and slice into Samara's stomach. Samara's mother, Hamida, told the Independent she just fell. I could see blood coming from her stomach. She was gasping, Mama, Mama. Hey, white sister of missile, did you manufacture integral components for was the most used munition in the aerial bombardment of Iraq, which saw the deaths of nearly 100,000 civilians. That's why we're here. That's why we're not going away. That's why we fought the injunction and that's why we won it. We are waiting. We are not going anywhere until this factory closes down. We know that components made in this factory are sold to the US. And the US went into Somalia in January and bombed civilians. We've come here to shut Edo down. And that's what we aim to do. Time to get up this morning. Good morning. <laughs> what time is it though? I don't know, it's offensive o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Are you trying to get into EDO? Yeah. Yeah, it's closed today, so... Why is the factory closed today? You Don't you to work for a piece, living? Mate. Do you work for a living? I work for a living. <laughs> no, it's, it's concrete. Concreted. <laughs> it's concreted. What, what yeah, you can't. It's come over again. Here's the southern gate. It's got one concrete the main gate to allow access. And we've got uh, one... What you're doing here is grubby and disgusting and we will not tolerate it. You should be ashamed to show your faces in Brighton. You should be ashamed of yourselves. You should be ashamed to tell people what you do for a living. 
because what you do is disgusting. And everybody in Brighton knows about it. I think very quickly the management told the workers not to communicate with us because there wasn't very much give and take between us and the workers. You know, we would try to talk to them and they wouldn't answer us. And they, you know, you know, we, we have found out from people that have done temp work there that they've been told not to communicate with us. They didn't even kind of swear at us or say sod off really at the beginning. They just looked really kind of spooked about it and they just sort of hurried in. What you found is there was um, quite a lot of people that just hadn't hadn't realised what the company was doing, was really surprised that suddenly there were people, you know, that cared enough to demonstrate. Yeah! At least two of the workers resigned in, in just this early period. I've no doubt that the factory have got a very serious recruitment problem because people now know what they do. And, and their friends and family know what PPO do. Just imagine what it might be like to really see massacre dead bodies of the people that you know, you care about and you love. Maybe you should think about that before you go into work and build bombs. If you, like, say, mention family or friends and how they'd feel if their family or friends were, you know, caught in, caught in the middle of a war, then that that often strikes a chord and you can see people's faces and they do like. the employees they've got left are kind of the hardcore and they're you know they're dedicated to their jobs and their careers and their wages you can sort of sense the the animosity of them as the cars leave there's um you know you'll see like two fingered salutes or you know people swear at you occasionally Those people have fought for you you wanker some people will close their car windows and drive off as quickly as possible Some people will smile with their windows wide open and drive off slowly as, as if to wind us up. And some of them really hate us, some of them are quite aggressive. Because we're proud of what we do, Sunshine. You're John. proud, you're proud, proud of you. Yes, you're proud. 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 Well, shame upon you. Shame? Yes, I'm very shame. Have you got a grandfather? Yes, I have. Did he fight he in the war? Been. No, he didn't, yes, thankfully. He must have been. But what's it going to do with bombing places in Germany? You're no better than a Look. conscience as objector, Sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. I'm I'm objector. Objector. I'm, I'm, so there is obviously a lot of anger on their part, but it doesn't it doesn't come out very often towards us. Apart from sometimes when we do the lock ons and the demos, people have been attacked by workers, people have had their D locks pulled. I mean I'd like to think that some of it is good. Um, I think that people who work at places like Edo manage to do what they do by not thinking about it. And I think they probably get quite angry with us because we try to make them think about it. When you work in Brighton, because it's people like Brighton. you that make people think. Yeah. yeah, and you say so like thinking's wrong, wrong, is it? No, it's thinking it's wrong. wrong that all. whole get a job, dull scrounging scum does come out from them. I think they they classify us and they, they find it easier to hate us in that way. We're doing a job, Sunshine. We're doing a job. What job do you do, mate? What job do you do? Oh, sure. Do you? Yeah, yeah. Well, you, can, you can't say get that get a job stuff went out in the 60s. You know, if you're not a very introverted person, being tried to force to look into what you're doing and how you earn your money and your life is, is quite uncomfortable. And they probably were a bit scared of us because we had a completely different world view from them and that we want it, that we were willing to spend our spare time sitting there telling them about it. Can you really wake up tomorrow morning and seriously think that possibly I might not go to work today because I'm responsible for the death of people? And we're not just talking about armies, we're talking about innocent people, civilians, women, children. I just don't yawn about it. You know, how you do that? This is very real. Anyone that's, that probably has recognised that guilt in themselves have just left. But yeah, the people that has taken a long, longer time to think about it probably are now getting just angry with it just going on and on. Can you now stay off that property? I'm pushing on the bike or you'll be in trouble. Oh, really? Yeah. Yes. It's not the sort of thing you have to do to get the work, is it? <laughs>
of protesting. I'm not against that. Very early on, I think the police were um, sort of just hoping that this would be another flash in the pan, that there would be a few few demonstrations and then the whole thing would kind of fold. And thank God it's only for the day. When it become obvious that wouldn't happen, that's when the police really started, um, you know, really trying their best to nick people. Really trying their best to kind of, you know, hurt people. In public, to a lot of people, the police have shown themselves for what they are. Why are you following us? I just want to tell you. Why are we following Yeah. Yeah. been instructed to. Well, is that is that it? They, they use every tactic in the book um, to either get round us or to put us out of business. If we all went shopping, would you follow us around the shop? What happens if we split up? Why do you personally think you're following me? <laughs> You've actually created a demonstration there. The political question is, is, is harsh, it's too much, they're too aligned with, they, they should be unbiased, but they're too aligned with you doing that. The police essentially will decide they don't like someone and then they'll try and find a law that gives them the excuse to arrest that person. Well, we're not experts. No, I know that. <laughs> Did you confirm that again? We're not experts. The camp was there, I think, just to open up the campaign, maybe for the community and for people all over the country actually as well. And there were children there. It was it was a wonderful, peaceful camp. Don't pour it over me. What's up with you? What on earth are you doing? And they basically handed out um, letters of eviction to every single tent that was there. Do you have intentions of going up to the peace camp? I did. You did. May I um, just uh, show you this, sir? It basically informs you that it's an offence to erect a tent in parks and open spaces in the city of Brighton and Hove without permission. You will be given until half past two to remove all the structures situated within this area. It's the thing they stuck, they stuck onto our den earlier. It's going to burn it. This is a protest. It's been advertised as a protest, um, and that's what it is at the moment. This is what I think of the police. So you're admitting that this is a political eviction? It's not a political eviction, it's a protest, okay. of which you're protesting, you're not, you're not going to be stable. And then after that, they come back an hour, later, an hour later and just dismantled everybody's tents. Everything, all of our belongings were inside and they just literally took up all, everything, all the tents. They arrested our belongings, <laughs> took them to the police station and um, held them for like a week. Support us more and more, uh, and I don't, I don't believe these people are a human being. I don't uh, convince in this uh, uh, idea, and uh, I believe uh, if we, uh, if we connect to doing this, they will must remove.
and uh, thanks all the this group it's amazing things it's really amazing things thank you guys Recently the situation has changed and suddenly, although nothing's happened from the point of view of the protesters, it's still the same people going out there, but suddenly um, there were seven or eight police going up there and they were filming uh, the protesters every week. So, you know, I, I believe the police have probably kind of come up with another strategy um, to use kind of existing public order offences and they try to use a bylaw up there as well. He's been reported under the bylaw with the noise that he's making. The bylaw? Yes. This? Just him. <laughs> Just him at the moment, yes. Yeah. Come on. No one else. Just him. No, just this one at the moment, yes. yes. Obviously all the, the injunction terms have been removed, but the police are back to using the old public order laws. People are now getting threatened with um, Section 5. Um, they've just trotted out a, a local bylaw which prohibits the use of um, amplified music. Um, which they're trying to use against people who talk on the megaphone or use the sound system up there. I'm just going to say now that obviously if this does cause any disturbance, unnecessary disturbance, then I will invoke the bylaw with regards to the confiscation of the equipment as evidence with regards to reporting whoever may or may not have, whoever may have been involved in setting up this equipment. What bylaw is that? The uh, Brighton and Hope final. I'll right. give you a you copy. One four years. Would you like a copy? I'd love one. There you go, sir. Well, I know we are not the only group to receive police harassment. The Smashido group has had 15 arrests on trumped-up charges since August alone. The crimes as diverse as karaoke singing. <laughs> And the people who permitted it to be used and organised will be arrested. I'm Inspector Cundant, that is what will happen. Take all the sound equipment. Okay, so all Nothing of this. Nothing better to do, boys. No fun. We don't see the arrest of the man. He's illegal arrest. Why didn't you pick on him? Why should the boy annoy anybody else? So they're basically they're grasping at straws again to try and find some way to stop freedom of expression and assembly outside the factory. So you failed with the injunction. You've generally failed at the criminal law, and you think this dodgy little boiler is going to stop us? Report away, Inspector. OK, sir. Yes, Simon. There's the famous um, Zyklon B case in which um, the company Zyklon B supplied gas to the Nazis during the Second World War. Um, after that there was cases brought against directors and also employees of the company. Not surprisingly the um, employees were acquitted because they, there's no way they can be held accountable. They have no control over where the gas goes. But the directors were held to be complicit in war crimes because they have control over where that product ends up. Now in this country at the moment, there is this culture of impunity where individuals are not held accountable for their actions. We at Smash EDO believe that Paul Hill should be held responsible for at least some of the deaths and good suffering that have been in Somalia, in Iraq. I do nothing to justify you know I don't. There's no doubt that EDO are supplying weapons components 
which will end up being used um, in bombs which will in a, end up killing people. That is the nature of the arms trade. I think that the arms company has gained notoriety for its, its activities. Before the campaign started, I think hardly anybody knew um, that Edo existed. Um, hardly anybody knew there was an arms company in Brighton. The people who work in that factory now know that everybody knows what they do at work and that I think has probably had a real impact. want to launch a campaign or a battle of any kind against somebody, you don't automatically go for the kind of strongest, um, you know, the strongest kind of link. You go for the weakest link. Uh, we are one nil so far, so you wouldn't want to get two of them. scores, are we? Yes, we are. Don't worry. <laughs> don't, don't, don't worry. That's, that's three, four years you've been here. The campaign's now been going on for, um, coming up to four years. I think that's four nil to us, isn't it? We've been no, I know, it's, it's no skin off our nose, mate. We've cost you a million quid. The campaign does intend to win. We do intend to shut the factory down. But that's a victory as far as we're concerned. It's made, it's made worth every second. The military-industrial complex, the war machine, the arms industry, whatever you want to call it, is, is very big and very powerful in this country. And I think it's hard to know where to focus with it sometimes. The other reason for targeting these companies, the, the companies who are supplying the nuts and bolts that go into the arms industry, uh, is because they are small companies and because we, we can win. EDI is right on our doorstep. It's, it's a very doable target. It's a waste of time um, standing outside Rolls-Royce in, in Bristol. You know, you're just kind of not going to be heard. Um, but it's kind of really, really important to kind of protect these, these, kind of, uh, these local small arms manufacturers. Size doesn't matter. Um, it's what the end results of those products achieve and, and that is ultimately killing innocent people. It is just another link in the chain. It's all the same. It's all the same chain. It's all, it's all part of the same bigger setup. If we can shut them down, it will um, send out ripples right across the arms trade. Workers of Edo MBM, of course he the reason people are outside your factory is because we're not going to go away until we shut you down. We're here for and we time. are going to shut you down, Mr. Hills. We will shut you down. I think, I think if they could kind of, um, if they could move today with their tail between the legs and, not, and nobody know actually that they've gone, I think they kind of probably don't want to lose face. Are you not doing very, very, very well, are you? What have you proposed <coughs> so far? Edo Corp are not doing very well. Edo MBM have lost too much money. It's highly possible that Edo will look at Britain and think it's no point having this company in this country. Factory is very, very keen not to let us know what impact we're having. How much money have we cost your company? Chris, in ten minutes. Tell me how much money have we cost your company? We hold you to that. Is that a secret? What are you going to do? Are you yeah. going to climb over the... Lots and lots of directors have resigned. There have been at least five resignations of directors since the campaign started. This is a company who, who really are um, on the verge of, um, of shutting down. I think the campaign can win. Um, and I think that will be a very significant thing. And if we shut this factory down, if we can shut down this outpost uh, of a US arms company in Britain, in Brighton, if we can shut them down, that will send out a very powerful message that people power can succeed, that people power can affect the outcomes of these wars, of these conflicts. If you stand out here, the last three years shouting at me, what are you going to win? Well, I just told you, winning would mean shutting down your factory. You're not going to do that. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. The yeah. message is out there. The message is out there that there is an arms company in Brighton and that there is an ongoing campaign to get rid of it. And we are going to shut you down, Mr. Hills. We are going to win. We are going to win. We are going to be here until you're not.